deeply worrying what Iran is doing across the region and even beyond. Um, and you just have to look at the strikes uh, in Pakistan, a sovereign country, no doubt without the authority of, of the government of Pakistan, unlike US strikes into the tribal areas of Pakistan, which were coordinated by the US against Al-Qaeda with the government of Pakistan. Then you have to consider their strikes against US forces and US targets in Iraq and Syria. Um, we've seen more, many more than 100 of those now since the beginning of the current Gaza conflict against the US. And there, of course, were plenty before that as well. And on top of that, you have to consider um, all of the fueling that, uh, that Iran is doing of the war in Gaza, including fueling of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, uh, and, um, and, and I I Iranian proxies in Syria who have been carrying out attacks against Israel. In, in, in addition to which, we've seen claims of Iranian proxies in Iraq carrying out rocket attacks against Israel. And of course, there have been a series of attacks against not only against Israel, but against uh, international shipping in the Red Sea by the Houthis from Yemen, again, a, an Iranian proxy. And if you add on top of that, the, the fact that Iran has been supplying vast quantities of killer drones to Russia to attack it, uh, Ukrainian civilians, I think, you know, that it becomes very obvious um, the role that Iran is playing across the region in, in fomenting and supporting conflict. It was certainly long overdue to carry out strikes against the Houthis. They've been, for a long time now, they've been launching missiles against international shipping. They've been having a major impact on, uh, a growing impact on the global economy, including forcing shipping to avoid use of the Red Sea and Suez Canal and going having to go right round Africa, vast expense in, in dollars and pounds and also in time. Um, and, 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 the, and, and, and it needs to, it does need to be dealt with. The, the defensive measures that were originally implemented, in other words, protecting shipping against attack, clearly was not working. Um, and, and therefore the coalition had to go on to a, a more offensive footing. But there, are, there have been problems with that. First of all, I think the attacks were signalled um, well in advance, in public, by the U UK certainly, that uh, the Houthis were about to be attacked, which would mean that they would get the, what they needed, certainly their terrorists and probably some of the equipment out of the sites they thought might be attacked. Um, uh, and, and secondly, uh, you know, since, since the attack, the, the strikes took place, we've seen further attacks in the Red Sea against shipping by the Houthis. So therefore, it clearly has not worked and it requires a much more significant offensive campaign against the Houthis. I would also argue that it's time to, uh, to, to directly target the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, the Iranian uh, entity that is responsible for, uh, for organizing, funding, supplying, uh, arming, and directing many of these, if not all of these Iranian proxies around the region. I, I think sh short of targeting them and de dealing them a significant blow, I think we're going to see very little uh, impact from, from our other military actions. Attacking IRGC bases wherever they may be, preferably inside Iran, although that might be a, a bridge too far from the point of view of uh, escalation, which, of course, the US is determined to avoid. But there are plenty of IRGC targets around the region which could be taken out by US-UK air power. Um, and, and I think... Um, you know, we just have to look at the role the IRGC has played uh, for many, many years, including the attacks that were carried out by their proxies against British forces and American forces in Iraq and Afghanistan when, we, when the campaigns were going on there. Uh, th this, they have a long track record, a long history of fomenting violence and terrorism in the Middle East. And I think direct confrontation with them is probably the only way to, to have an impact on it. The nuclear ambitions of Iran have been progressing in a very worrying way for a long time now. And, and in fact, by, in, by my understanding, they're not very far off having sufficient quantities of enriched uranium to be able to put together a number of nuclear weapons. The, 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 the big question mark is over their nuclear delivery capability, the weaponization of, of uh, nuclear materials. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the simple fact is we don't know yet whether they can do it or when they will be able to do it, but, but it's looming very fast.
and it really does have to be addressed. And the way to address it is not what President Biden has been doing so far, along with his uh, allies in Europe, which is to appease Iran and hope that they will play nicely if we are nice to them. That simply will not work. The only language they understand is force. Uh, and short of that, the only potentially effective means of at least having some impact on their nuclear program is by very, very harsh sanctions, which of course were lifted by firstly by President Obama and then by President Biden, which effectively gave the green light and, and gave a great deal of money to Iran, not only for its nuclear program, but also for its violence around the region. If Trump becomes president again, that's almost a given. Uh, he was the one who pulled the US out of the, the so-called nuclear deal with Iran, which was actually a deal that, um, that paved the way for an Iranian bomb. He rightly pulled the US out of that. President Biden, ever since he took office, has been trying his best, bending over backwards to try and get back into that nuclear deal. I, I would hope anyway, we would see from President Trump a far more robust approach towards Iran, which could, could have a huge impact beneficial impact across the Middle East. The Prime Minister of Israel has recently reiterated his intention to destroy Hamas as a threat to Israel. And so that goal will remain, uh, and, and of course, to try and get the, uh, the hostages out, which is, which is a parallel goal. Um, that, that those two goals will, I think, remain until they're achieved um, in some way. Uh, it, it does appear that in, in the South in particular, which is now the most heavily populated area of Gaza, with many refugees having moved from the north, that um, there will be more emphasis now on um, more pinpoint targeted special forces raids by the IDF. At the same time, I'm sure they will maintain some momentum in, in the um, more conventional operations they've been carrying out so far, including up in the north where Hamas continued to exist. I think the 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 the, the possible pin, more pinpoint targeted special forces operations that we may see uh, unfold now uh, have been made possible by intelligence collection during the course of the war so far. There have been a great number of documents of computers captured by the uh, Israelis, as well as interrogation of captured terrorist leaders, which I believe has given them a great deal of intelligence that they need uh, in order to launch such raids, you can't, there's no point in talking about pinpoint raids or whatever, unless you've got solid intelligence to guide them. But of course, there's always political constraints in war, um, which, which wherever a war is being fought, it's part of the whole deal. But certainly from my uh, discussions with IDF commanders, and I was in Gaza myself recently, talking to IDF generals near the front line uh, where the fighting was taking place. And, uh, and, and they, I believe, are very, Happy, happy may be the wrong word when you're talking about a war like this, but they 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 believe that their forces have achieved um, a significant amount and will go on to uh, achieve the the ultimate objective. So I, I think, despite the the constraints and the limitations that are placed on them, uh, I think I think I, I certainly detected a feeling of confidence that uh, the war is progressing in much the way they'd like. Of course, they're very. Um, you know, one always has to say, and rightly, that they're very aware of um, the civilian casualties that fall out of this conflict, as they do of all conflicts. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly I, I was uh, present in a command group meeting inside Gaza when this subject was being discussed in great detail between IDF generals, uh, who, who were very, very concerned to, to attack and destroy Hamas targets while minimising civilian deaths uh, in, in the vicinity of those targets. They've dropped millions, I think something like 9 million, that figure may not be 100% correct, but something like 9 million leaflets have been dropped on Gaza, giving, in Arabic, giving Gazan civilians notice that certain areas are going to be attacked, where is going to be safer for them to go, what routes are going to be safer for them to take, on top of which millions of phone calls, text messages, voice messages, have been sent to guards and civilians warning them to go. Um, there's a great deal of uh, very careful surveillance takes place over target areas so that the IDF can be confident before they launch an attack that there are 
no civilians in an area or a, a small number of civilians perhaps in an area if that's the best they can achieve. Of course, that's not always possible. Um, and on the ground, decisions have to be taken much more quickly, sometimes within you know seconds by a commander and mistakes happen. So there are a lot of civilian casualties. But if you look at the figures, I mean, the, the, the Hamas controlled Gaza Health Ministry has given a, a figure of, I think the latest figures are in about 23,000 casualties overall inside Gaza. Now, we can't depend on that. This comes from Hamas. It's the figures they want us to have. And they don't differentiate between fighters and, and civilians in their figures that they give out. Um, but let us say for a moment that that 23,000 is an accurate figure. The IDF say that they have killed the last figure I saw, which was a day or so ago. The IDF say they have killed 9,000 terrorists in Gaza since the start of the campaign. Um, and if you look at the, if you, if, if you take the Hamas figures as being maybe roughly accurate, I'm not saying they are, uh, then you get from that um, a casualty, a combatant to civilian casualty ratio of about 1.5 civilians to one fighter killed. Uh, that doesn't include, of course, uh, among that 1.5, it doesn't include um, civilians who have been killed by uh, Hamas itself in, in missiles that fall short or in uh, punishment executions, etc., that they've carried out, nor does it include death by natural causes, of which there'll be quite a few. So the 1.5 to 1, 1 1.5 civilians to 1 competent ratio is probably the worst case if you take Hamas's figures as being correct. Um, and, and that sounds awful. It does sound genuinely bad that 1.5 times as many civilians have been killed as fighters. But then you have to look at what the UN say about the, the total combatant to non-combatant casualty ratios in conflicts in urban areas, which this is predominantly. And their figures that they give are nine civilians for every combatant killed in conflicts around the world in urban areas. So nine to one versus 1.5 to 1. If these figures are correct, and of course we can't be 100% certain at this moment, but if, that, if they're something like correct, that itself proves, I think, the care that Israel's taking to avoid um, inflicting death on and wounding on civilians. What effectively South Africa is doing, uh, and South Africa is not a country that uh, has a great deal of moral high ground to stand on itself, but what South Africa is doing um, is effectively accusing a country that is fighting against a genocidal regime, it's accusing that country of genocide itself. It's inverting reality. Hamas is a genocidal terrorist organization. Their charter makes it only too clear. Their actions make it only too clear, including the actions on the 7th of October, including the words of their leaders they are absolutely clear they want to eliminate jews from the the land of israel from the from the territory that they claim from the river to the sea they want they want to kill or remove all jews from that area uh, that's that is basically the definition of genocide israel on the other hand is fighting against that genocide and it's not using genocide to fight genocide the the efforts i've described of um uh, attempts to try and minimise casualties would work against the, the, the accusation of genocide very clearly, in addition to which they've allowed significant quantities of humanitarian aid into Gaza, which is another mitigation against the accusation of genocide. And, and in fact, as I understand it, when I was last briefed on this a couple of days ago, the major uh, blockage to humanitarian aid getting into Gaza is not IDF restrictions, it's UN and aid agency restrictions in their own capabilities. So Israel is doing what it can to facilitate and is working to improve that. And the final element, I think, of South Africa's, um, what I would describe as obscene accusations, are uh, uh, comments by uh, leaders inside Israel uh, saying that we've got to kill all Palestinians, etc. Now, there have been some unwise and, and frankly, in some cases, disgraceful remarks along those lines, but they have not been made by those people who are leading either the IDF or the State of Israel in this war. Those, those have been made by other people out who do not have the kind of responsibility for directing the, the, the military campaign against Gaza. In fact, the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister and others have been absolutely explicit that the war is against Hamas, 
not against all Palestinians. So I, I find it shocking. And if, uh, but having said that, given that the International Court of Justice is a political court, it's not a true court of law. It works to a political agenda. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they don't find Israel guilty of genocide at some point uh, in, you know, in however many years it takes them to come to a conclusion. But if they do, they will be, it'll be a very, very uh, dire miscarriage of justice.